I think our speaker this morning needs very little introduction. I think most of you are familiar with Dr. Peter Lilback, but uh, we are so pleased to have him with us this morning as we are every time he visits. But for those of you who may be new here, I have not, are not familiar with uh, Peter. He is uh, the president of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's also a professor of historical theology there, and he is a prolific writer. And I won't go through all of the articles and books that he's written. He's probably best known for his, uh, what I call his magnum opus, uh, uh, spiritual biography on George Washington, titled George Washington's uh, Sacred Fire. So uh, Dr. Lilback is down in Dallas doing some research. When we found out that he was going to be doing that, we thought, well, we will uh, draft him into some service this morning, and he's going to be teaching this class, and then he'll be preaching in the second hour. So Peter, it's a delight to have you here. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Great. All right, I'm supposed to be Mike, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. good. Good to see you all today. Thank you for the privilege of being back uh, with my spiritual family here in Dallas. Believer's Chapel, as you know, is close to my heart. Uh, I'm going to be uh, sharing today on the theme of union with Christ. And uh, we're going to dim the lights because we're using a PowerPoint here. So hopefully you're not saying the darkness is overcoming the light. There's in John chapter 1, it says, and the darkness did not overpower it, right? So we want to make sure we keep the light in place. Uh, I want to make sure I stop at the right time. It's quarter after, is that right? Okay. So basically, this theme, Union with Christ, is a wonderful and expansive topic and I want us to take a very rapid survey of some scriptural aspects, some historical aspects, and then some practical implications. Uh, if you would like to have this PowerPoint for future use, it's totally your, yours to keep and share if you would want it. If you don't want it, you won't offend me, but if you do want to use it, it's, it will be made available. So basically, <clears throat> two texts that get us started. In John 16, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In other words, being in Christ was a doctrine of Christ himself. Now Jesus will expand it dramatically <clears throat> through his apostle Paul, who will make this one of the foundational aspects of Pauline theology. And a classic passage we could go to is Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4, where Paul will say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Those words described in the beginning of what Reformed theologians of various uh, traditions have called the monergism of soteriology, the unique priority of God in the salvation of sinners, that God takes the first step. Before there was a world, God was already working salvation for his people. We can take no credit for that. We didn't even exist. God had a plan. And it's in him, already in the Messiah. So union with Christ is a pretemporal concept and it's something that Jesus taught in time as he was incarnate as our Lord. So we're going to take this idea and try to give it a theological expression and then put it with some specific theologians through church history who've engaged it in different ways. Now there's uh, a lot more here than I can possibly cover, so I, some of the slides will go by really quickly. But don't worry, you can get them if you want them. Free of charge, uh, Pastor Dan, okay? So if you want to share them, feel free. So let's think about four distinct concepts of the doctrine of salvation. We can talk, first of all, about the history of salvation, sometimes called historia salutis. That is, that's the whole story of the Bible, if you will. It's a book of God saving his people. And then we can talk about the accomplishment of redemption, this is the work of Christ on the cross, and it's captured in those marvelous words. It is finished. The cost of salvation was paid in full. 
And then there's not the whole history of the Bible or the moment in time when the work of redemption is climaxed through the cross, but then it's applied to individual sinners, the application of redemption. It's what we have in mind when we sing that great song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, our personal experience when salvation is given to us. And then in that personal experience, each of us will find a place in how salvation is logically applied to us. Now, this is sometimes called the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. What comes first? Well, chosen in Christ, called in time, justified by faith, and then the work of the Holy Spirit sanctifying us. And we're experiencing then our adoption as the children of God until finally we get to heaven and we're glorified. So that's the order of salvation. And if we put a chart of that, we could uh, place it out, but I won't do it for the sake of time. Now, John Murray is one of the theologians that uh, I think is very important for us to, to consider here. A classic book that he wrote is Redemption Accomplished and Applied. I would recommend that you would get that. I think as uh, believers in God's sovereign grace here at Believer's Chapel, you'll find this as one of the most biblical expositions of those great truths of God's saving work in Christ. But in his chapter on redemption accomplished and applied, John Murray puts it this way, union with Christ is a very inclusive subject. The wide span of salvation from its ultimate source and the eternal election of God to its final fruition and the glorification of the elect. So what he says here is that you can use the phrase union with Christ and see it as a complete summary of everything that God does for us in salvation. So you can see it as the full summary, if you will, of everything that we have in Christ. But while we ought not to do this, it can be considered then as a specific aspect of the order of salvation. That is, when you're justified, you are un united to Christ in a personal sense. And so theologians use it in a very narrow sense and sometimes in a very broad sense. Murray wants us to see it here, not just a phase of the application of redemption, it underlies all of the application and accomplishment of redemption. Union with Christ and his approach is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation that we are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so we might see it in various ways, and we could uh, really spend a lot of time on this, but the classic Heidelberg Catechism question number one that many of us have been exposed to, what is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we won't go through the fullness of that summary, but the bottom line that we see there is that my comfort is I belong to Christ. I am united to Him. Uh, we have Calvin, uh, one of the great Reformation theologians, and he will use various words in his Institutes of the Christian Religion to describe union with Christ. We'll have the word engrafting, in sitio, the word communion, communio, fellowship, societas, and adoption, adoptio. He'll even use the language of spiritual marriage. On Ephesians 5, verses 30 to 32, he will say this. When Paul has said that we are flesh of the flesh of Christ, he adds at once, this is a mystery. For Paul did not mean to tell what sense Adam uttered the words. Remember, that's bringing up to the creation account of the first marriage. But to set forth under the figure and likeness of marriage, the holy union that makes us one with Christ. In other words, Calvin says, yes, marriage is a picture of union with Christ, the bond between husband and wife in marriage. Now, Calvin will flesh this out in a marvelous passage, uh, 2, 16, 19 of the Institutes, where I've summarized it as Christ alone. We often will sing the song, In Christ Alone. This is Calvin's version of In Christ Alone before the Gettys ever wrote the song, okay? He says, we see that our whole salvation and all of its parts are comprehended in Christ. 
We should therefore take care not to derive the least portion of it from anywhere else. And what follows then are 19 ifs related to Christ and the Christian. Okay, I, this has to be the record in literature, the most ifs ever put in an order. Okay, follow them. Okay, if we seek salvation, Calvin says, we are taught by the very name of Jesus that it is of Him. Jesus means Savior. If we seek any other gifts of the Spirit, they will be found in His anointing. That's His name, Christ. If we seek strength that lies in His dominion, that is in His name, the Lord Jesus Christ. If purity in His conception, by the Holy Spirit. If gentleness that appears in His birth, for by His birth He was made like us in all respects, that He might learn to feel our pain. Imagine the gentleness that God becomes an infant, unable to care for Himself. In the incarnation miracle. Six, if we seek redemption, it lies in His passion. If acquittal, in His condemnation. If remission of the curse, in His cross. If satisfaction, in His sacrifice. If purification, in His blood. If reconciliation, in His de descent into hell. If mortification of the flesh, in His tomb. If newness of life, in His resurrection. If immortality, in the same. If protection, if security, if abundant supply of all blessings, in His kingdom. And 19, if untroubled expectation of judgment, in the power given Him to judge. In short, this reformer says, since rich store of every kind of good abounds in him, let us drink our fill from this fountain and from no other. Calvin says, everything that we long for and need in our salvation is found in union with Christ. So what are some specific examples of living in union with Christ? When we think about the gospel, a wonderful way to pr present it is, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? All of us are born in Adam. Have you moved from being in Adam to being in Jesus Christ by faith? How do you read the Bible? Well, have we learned to read the Bible and discover that Christ is on every page? Because every page is pointing to union with God in Christ. The Savior to come, the Savior who has come, the Savior who will come again, the Savior who is present by the Spirit. When we do our theology, is union with Christ an afterthought or is it primary? Uh, when we understand the sacraments, when we come to the Lord's table, when we see baptism administered, do we see how they show us our bond in union with Christ? Well, we can keep going on. I could, there's a whole sermon series right here, so I'll have to stop on that one. Okay, some of the key phrases in Paul's letters are found in Christ and with Christ. I think uh, theologians have tried to work with exegetes, and they say there are some... 80 plus instances of these phrases appearing in Paul's epistles. In other words, the next time you read Paul's letters, go after like a laser, in Christ, with Christ. Uh, Christ with us, how often it appears. This is his underlying thing. It's so easy to overlook those little phrases. It's the preposition. But aren't you glad your heart is in you? Being in something is pretty important. Every place you go, your heart goes with you. You are in Christ. Wherever Christ goes, you go with Him. You are united to Christ. And so we see a number of references here. There's some of the leading examples. But we even find it in John's teaching through our Lord in His classic teaching in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. There's a unity uh, between the parts of the plant. There is a in grafting, that's Jesus' teaching. And when we come to his epistles, it's a fellowship, a koinonia. Calvin will use the word societas. We are in a fellowship with Christ, a common sharing. These are central themes. Phil Riken, a former board member at Westminster, and by the way, followed Dr. Boyce at 10th Presbyterian. Now he's serving as president uh, at Wheaton, wrote an article some years ago in a Feshrift I helped to edit, and I've always appreciated what he said, so I quote that for you here. He puts it this way, believers often are said to be in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Sometimes this phrase passes by so rapidly that we may hardly notice, as in Paul's opening address 
to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. We just slip right by. The saints in Christ Jesus. We should emphasize that, but we let it slip right by. The saints are in Christ Jesus. But even such passing expressions are grounded in the deep spiritual truth of our faith union with Jesus Christ. The reason we are called saints in Christ is because our true and ultimate identity is found in Him. You are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3, 28. He goes on to say, on other occasions, the Bible teaches the reciprocal principle that Jesus Christ is in the believer. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. Similarly, Paul wrote of the gospel mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, Colossians 1.26. What is this glorious mystery? He says in the next verse, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. The two sides of this mutual relationship are found in Scripture. For example, in John 15, the vine and the branches, and 1 John 4, our union we have through the Holy Spirit. Now, church history. So who are some of the theologians that tried to develop this doctrine? Well, St. Patrick, do we have any Irish folks out there? Anyone willing to admit it? <laughs> okay, there's one over there, okay. So the Irish tradition, St. Patrick, who is uh, the, f you may not know a lot about him. Another one is Bernard of Clairvaux, okay? He was one of the reformers and uh, let's say pre-reformers sort of from France, trying to get the church in the medieval era back to scripture. We've mentioned Calvin. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, St. Patrick. Perhaps you're familiar with what's called St. Patrick's breastplate. Do you ever hear his morning prayer? It is actually a, a, one of the most beautiful prayers ever written. It's not fully Protestant, but it's close enough that you can pray it with great delight. Okay, he says this, I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today through the strength of the love of cherubim and the obedience of angels and the service of archangels, and the hope of resurrection to meet with reward, and the prayers of patriarchs, and the predictions of prophets, and the preaching of apostles, and the faith of confessors, and the innocence of holy virgins, and the deeds of righteous men. I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, the firmness of rock, I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from snares of devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill afar and near. I summon today all these powers. He goes to the next one, Christ to shield me today. And then listen to this. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Now, St. Patrick basically is saying, the reason I had courage to bring the gospel to those Irish pagans, because Jesus Christ and I are united by faith. As the world becomes more and more pagan, more and more hostile, it's our union with Christ that should give us courage to be unafraid to engage the world. That's an ancient church witness of union with Christ in prayer. Bernard of Clairvaux is a, another leader. There's much we could do here, and for the sake of time, 
I'm going to pass over the delightful medieval history of Bernard of Clairvaux. As a church historian, I grieve to have to do this, but time is waning. And so you'll get the notes and can look at them later if you want. There's much that Bernard uses. In fact, I would suggest that Calvin was influenced by Bernard. You'll find that he quotes him a few times in the Institutes. He was aware of his work. We've already mentioned a fair amount of uh, Calvin, but we'll taste a little bit with him here. Uh, he will say on the essential character of union with Christ, quote, we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us. Therefore, to share with us what he has received from the Father, he had to become ours and to dwell within us. We also, in turn, are said to be engrafted into him and to put on Christ. For as I have said, all that he possess is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. Now, what he's saying is, is that Jesus has no value to anyone unless there is a true union between Christ and you. So this might be a great occasion just to stop and preach the gospel for a minute. Have you really trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he just an idea that's out there, a person of history? Or has he become to you the living Savior in whom your very heart depends, whose spirit speaks to you when you open the word and bears witness that you are a child of God? Is there a union with Christ? If there's not, this is time to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. The mystery of salvation is I'm one with you and you're one with me. The hunger and thirst for righteousness is something that God is putting in your heart. Reach out to Christ. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But as long as Christ is out there and not in here, he's not your Savior. He is the Savior, but he's not yours. And if he is yours from eternity past, his spirit is drawing you to himself and he would have you one with him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. I'm preaching the gospel now. I hope you'll put your faith in Christ. I, I cannot do this for you. But if the Spirit is speaking, he's calling you right now, drawing you to himself. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father in heaven draw him. But when the word of God is preached, those that are his sheep hear his voice, and they follow him because they're united to Christ. Calvin then affirms what we might call the mystical union of the believer with Christ. Now, as very exegetically, biblically oriented people, we get worried about when we hear the word mystical things, some experiential things. Well, our great reformer, Calvin, recognizes that there's something mysterious that God does through the Word and through the Spirit, and that we recognize that this is God's work. He's invisible to us, but his power is sensed. Jesus described it in John 3 as the wind. Can't see where the wind comes from or where it goes, but you know when it's blowing because of its power. So Calvin puts it this way. Therefore, that joining together of head and members, that indwelling of Christ in our hearts, in short, that mystical union, are accorded by us the highest degree of importance so that Christ, having been made ours, makes us shares with him in the gifts with which he has been endowed. We do not, therefore, contemplate him outside ourselves from afar in order that his righteousness may be imputed to us, but because we put on Christ and are engrafted into his body, in short, because he deigns to make us one with him. For this reason, we glory that we have fellowship of righteousness with him. For Calvin, there is a living personal bond. And that's the theology that's beyond, behind what we often hear in gospel preaching. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. It is being united to the living Christ. Okay. Calvin will use the words of even the spiritual marriage. We noted that earlier. Let me just go, I'll read the uh, second of the bullet points here. This union alone ensures that as far as we concerned, he has not unprofitably come with the name of Savior, 
The same purpose is served by that sacred wedlock through which we are made flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone and thus one with him. But he unites himself to us by the Spirit alone. By the grace and power of the same Spirit, we are made his members to keep us under himself and in turn to possess him. The power of regeneration, the Holy Spirit, new birth, is what makes us one with Christ, what gives us faith and gives us that sense of his presence within us. Now, there, there are many different quotes that we can parallel between Bernard and Calvin, which I cannot pursue because of time. But let's go on and talk a little bit more about this idea of union with Christ uh, from John Murray, this sub, uh, he has a 20th century theologian. He puts it this way, analogy does not equal identity. Comparison is not equation. Of all the kinds of union or unity that exist for creatures, the union of believers with Christ is the highest. The greatest mystery of being is the Trinity itself, three persons and one God. And so he's going to say when we use analogies like the vine and the branches or marriage, they, they're not to be taken as exact identity, but rather we should see them as giving a spiritual truth. And the greatest mystery is the scriptures that tell us that we are one with Christ, one with God. God dwells in us and we dwell in him. This is a likeness between Christ and the Father. Somehow we share in that. And we'll think, look at that a little bit later. So he says, the great mystery of godliness is the mystery of the incarnation. The Son of God became man and was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. The greatest mystery of creaturely relationships is the union of the people of God with Christ is compared to the unity of the Father and Son in the Godhead. He says we need an intelligent mysticism in the life of faith. Fellowship with Christ means communion. The life of faith is one of a living union and communion with the exalted and ever-present Redeemer. Now that's theological jargon. Let me try to make it very simple. Okay, what is he saying? We look at our charismatic and Pentecostal friends and they have all this exuberance and they seem to ignore the Bible. There are others of us that are very exegetical and biblically driven and we're almost afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. It's word and spirit, it's both. When we come to the word of God, our hearts are to experience the reality of the living Christ within us. It is a mystery, but there's a mystical union the Holy Spirit is bringing. It's not absent from the Word. It's through the Word by the Spirit. It's not the Spirit versus the Word. No, our doctrine of salvation of God's sovereignty says Word and Spirit are inseparably united. True salvation brings to us the work of the Holy Spirit and the living Christ through the Word and only through the Word, not without the Word. But if you have the Word without the Spirit, you just have ink on a piece of paper. We are to seek the living God. It is a union by the power of the Spirit through faith. And this is what uh, Murray is saying. And by the way, Murray was a Scotsman. He was the most disciplined, logical thinker you can imagine. If you read any of his works, you say, you've got to really be a serious theologian. He said, no, there's a mystery here, and it's real. It's true. There. Now, and so he likes, I like this balance. He says it is a a kind of an intelligent mysticism, a spiritual reality that's based on the Word. We don't separate them. They're together. Okay. So um, we might ask the question, uh, what is this mystery of union with Christ? Here are some of the things that might describe it. Christ came, was crucified, died, and rose. This is the historical direction of faith. That is a profound mystery. How is it possible that God could become man and then die and rise? Because he rose, we look now to the one who ever lives as our high priest and advocate. How do I see Christ on the throne in heaven? And yet that's who I pray to. That's who I go to. He's the one that intercedes. That's a mystery. I cannot see Christ upon the throne of grace, but that's where I appeal when I pray and when I seek forgiveness, when I bring others to faith in Christ through the gospel preaching. Because he's the living Lord and Savior, our faith also looks in fellowship to him and reaches the zenith of its exercise 
as it lifts its gaze to heaven. Christ is my Lord, and I reach up and say, Jesus, I'm in fellowship with you. I am in partnership with, and you are with me. When I worship collectively or privately, I am seeking to be encountering the risen Christ. All of this has no comparison in human to human relationships. First Peter 1, 8 through 9 says it well. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter says, Christ is ascended into heaven. We can't touch him in this world, but we're filled with overflowing joy knowing he's ours. That joy is coming from heaven through the word, through the power of the spirit. So the life of faith is the life of love, the life of fellowship. It is mystic, sweet communion with him who ever lives to make intercession for his people. Jesus is praying for us right now. He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities as you go through the crisis and pain of living through a broken world with all of its hurt and difficulty and uh, despair at times and grief. He's being touched by that. There's a real union with him who has an inexhaustible reservoir of sympathy for his people. He is showering upon us the certainty that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not things present, nor things to come, not life, nor death. Nothing can separate us. He's assuring us that we're his. Indeed, he was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. And so in the midst of our greatest temptations, afflictions and infirmities. Jesus is present with us. Now you say, well, Pete, how did you come up with it? I'm just quoting John Murray. Those are his words. That's this erudite theologian. He's saying, this is the mystery that we share in. It is our union with Christ that we live in day by day if we have the faith of the gospel. So there's more we could say here. I'm watching my time, so I'm going to jump to this slide. So then, he will say, and I'm borrowing Murray again here, the life of faith must not be called metallic ascent. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think there's many of you out there that listen to Metallica, or if you do, you wouldn't admit it in this, right? You said, well, I don't even know who they are. Well, you know what? Murray says there's a lot of Metallica reformed people out there. I'm just a robot. I believe reformed theology. You say it's not cold, metallic. It's filled with the power of the gospel. Jesus Christ chose you, and there's joy in knowing that he'll never leave you. He won't abandon you. He's at work in your heart. In the crises of your life, you don't just keep a stiff upper lip. You overwhelmingly praise God because he's working it together for his glory and for good, not because it's pleasant, but because the cross has turned into the greatest gift the world has ever seen. And God doesn't waste our suffering and sorrow. He uses it all for the purposes of his kingdom to honor his name. It's time to melt a little bit, to rejoice in the power of the Spirit, because that's biblical. That's what Murray is saying here. A Christian life of faith must have the passion and warmth of love and communion, because communion with God is the crown and apex of true religion. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 3. Now let that sink in. John, John didn't say, yeah, we're going to get together and have a Christian fellowship, and oh, i got to put up with Mike Black and Dan Duncan. Well, they're good guys, but you know, I know them. We're, we're tired of our years. Years ago, we were good friends in seminary. Now, we get, we're, we're a community with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. And that sweetness never dies if you're really looking to the truth of Scripture. Truly, the Bible says, our fellowship, our apostolic and regular believer fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. We have commonality with them when we gather. Right now, we're in God's presence. Do you really believe that? That's what we're saying. We're not just a bunch of attenders on a class. We're coming into the presence of the Word of God. That's why on the road to Emmaus, those disciples, as they heard Jesus teach, they said, 
Their hearts burned within them. When's the last time you looked at the Word of God? Said, Lord, it's passion. I thank you. I love you. This is true. This is my life. I want to live for you. That should not be a rarity. That should be our experience. Through the Word of God, the Spirit is calling us to truly commune with Word and Spirit in the presence of the living God with whom we have this commonality. Again, union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. Our union and communion with Christ accomplishes all eternal election and predestination, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. The once for all accomplishment of redemption, the actual application of redemption to those who partake of salvation, and the consummated bliss of eternal life, all of that is summarized in this great union with Christ. And so he says, this is what brings the believers blessings of confidence, strength, comfort, and joy. Union with Christ, zenith of blessings, is adoption that orbits union with Christ. These are twin stars that orbit around each other. We're adopted as sons, we're united to Christ, and we live in that wonderful integration. So union with Christ is, in fact, union with each member of the Trinity. If we had time, we could look at the verse that says, the Father comes to dwell in you. Christ comes to dwell in you. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You are in Christ. You are in the fellowship of the Godhead by the redemptive combination of salvation through the covenant of grace. So what is biblical mysticism? This idea that there is a real spiritual union, this intelligent mysticism that is part of union with Christ. Communion does not equal rapturous ecstasy. It leads us to the deposit revelation of Scripture's truth. It's not mindless emotionalism. It's not sensationalism, enthusiasm. It is the overflowing joy of seeing the truths of Scripture as your own as the Spirit of God leads you into that partnership of faith. It enables us to embrace the names of the person of our triune God. In other words, these names of God become the names that are really what we understand for ourselves. When you pray to you, are you praying to your Father? Or is that just some abstract title? Can you say Abba? Remember that Hebrew word really means Daddy. You know, it's so beautiful when my grandchildren come and say, Pop, Pop. That's the equivalent of Daddy for a grandfather. Okay. When my daughters came to me and said, Daddy, it's precious. We're allowed to say that to our Heavenly Father. All the names, for, is he El Shaddai? The one who's all sufficient, who provides every need. Yahweh, is he the I am that I am? Always, unchangeably the same absolutely trustworthy from eternity past to eternity future right now. Is he, Lord, our righteousness, Yahweh Tzedekinu, when we realize our sin and we fail to realize, God, you are my righteousness. There's hope for me. I can be forgiven. I can be right with you. El Elyon, the one who has power when you feel so weak. I can't do it. When I'm weak, that's when I'm strong because your grace is powerful, sufficient for me. The mighty God, the Lord of hosts, our Son, the Lord Jesus, is He your Savior? Is He your Redeemer? Do you see Him as your exalted Lord? Is He your older brother who won't let you go? He ain't heavy. He's my brother. That's what Jesus says about you. You are a drag, aren't you? No, to the Lord, you're, you're His brother. He loves you. Your older brother. He is the Lord, the ruler, Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, the anointed one who can give his spirit to you. Do you look to the spirit as the advocate, the comforter? That Greek word parakletos means one called alongside. When you need a lawyer, you want one alongside. When you need a counsel, you want one alongside. When you got to move a piano, you want someone strong alongside. He's the one that comes alongside to help you in whatever you need. He is your spiritual, he's your sanctifier who makes you holy when you realize you can't ever be right with God. He's the Holy Spirit, but he dwells with you. That's the truth of the scriptures. What biblical mysticism means, each of these we grow to experience by the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, Romans 8.16. 
Notice, while revelation in its declarative final form is concluded, the canon has ended, but the work of the Spirit's revealing continues. He reveals God's presence, God's truth in our hearts, and he witnesses with our spirit that says, Lord, I'm unworthy, but you have forgiven me. Lord, by your grace, you've called me. Lord, these truths of the Bible are my truths, not because of me, but because of you. Believers enter into the holy of holies of communion with the triune God because we are raised up and seated together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. This is one of the most extraordinary statements of the Bible. To realize because of union with Christ, we are already in heaven at the throne of God, united to Christ. We are in Christ Jesus. We are there. There's a sense in which glorification is already. Even though you look in the mirror this morning and say, oh, it's not yet. I got a long way to go. But it's true. It's ours. We are seated together in heavenly as Christ. Our lives are hidden with Christ and God. We thus can draw nigh unto God in full assurance of faith, the scriptures teach. So as we wrap up, I've got about a minute left. There was a, a book written again by my friend Phil Riken called When Trouble Comes. He says, whenever we feel as if we have had enough, we need to go back to Jesus and learn again that he is more than enough. All that we have need of is in him. This is where we come back to the fountain of all that we're called to be through the word of God, by the power of the spirit, Jesus Christ gives it to us. So it's an all-encompassing doctrine. It's a specific part of the doctrine of salvation, but it covers all of the doctrine of salvation. So I wish I had time to go through these final things to kind of summarize. So, but uh, I will just simply end with this. Consider then finally the biblical illustrations of union with Christ. The wide range of similitude of Scripture to explain or illustrate union with Christ is striking. And so from the order of the lowest, from the inanim inanimate to the highest, the divine. Analogies are not identities, but they are in fact truths. So think about these expressions of union with Christ that the Bible gives to us as believers in Christ. One orientation, the stones of a building and the cornerstone. The cornerstone shapes the direction of every other stone in the entire building. It shapes everything thereafter. Jesus is our cornerstone, and you're a stone in that building. He is shaping your life by your union with him. Life and nourishment, the vine and the branches. He's our vine. We find our sustenance flowing from him because we're united to him. Direction, control, and coordination. He is the head, and we are the human body. The head directs all the rest of the body. And so it is that Christ is flowing like the nervous system of the body to direct us in all directions, to control, to coordinate. There's covenanted communion and loving care. We have marriage as a picture. The love of a husband and wife in its best is a picture of our salvation. We are represented before God in this union. We are no longer in union with Adam. We're in the second and last Adam, the one who did not fail, the one who does not have to face death, the one who's taken the curse and overcome it. We are in Christ. We are in representation and covenant life. And then finally, our union with Christ is captured in the profound, eternal, unbreakable love and unity as seen in the Trinity itself. And we find scriptures that tell us the Father comes to make his abode in you as, and so does the Son. And you are in him and he is in you. And this by the Holy Spirit. I'm not making any of this up. This is what the Bible teaches. Let us claim it. This is our treasure. Well, let's pray together. Father, this has been a whirlwind tour of one of the greatest truths and most profound mysteries that we can encounter. We ask that you bless these words and these thoughts to our growth in grace and to our service for you. Draw those who need to know you today to yourself, I humbly pray. For each of us, Lord, who know you, would you renew within us 
the fire of the Spirit through the Word of God for your glory alone. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.